Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. Today, we're together to exploring the use cases for clone native HCIs, which harvester. So, a little bit of self introduction first. My name is Shen Yang. I'm engineer director for SUSE. I have joined Rancher Labs in 2015, and I have joined SUSE through the Rancher Labs position in 2021. So, I'm the co creator and currently the product owner for Longhorn and Harvester. Let's start with one. A long time ago, like 30, 20 years ago, when you were thinking about how are you going to run your applications, like you were going to think about, yeah, I'm going to package it, run the processes on top of the operating system. At that time, normally you're going to have one node per, like one CPU per node. And you're only going to have like one instance of your operation system per node as well. And all of these applications services are in fact organized using the process. Like the process can be heavy as in Windows, can be light as in Linux, but the processes and the packages are the basic factors for you to deploy any of your applications. The package format can be different. You can Build from scratch using Tarzi and like something like Gen2 Linux2, and you can use RPM and you can use Debian DEB packages, and you always almost have another package manager to help you manage the dependencies between those packages, right? So that's been going on for in fact for a very long time until we found that it's harder to harder to create a faster CPUs. The Moore's law still should apply, but instead of like creating faster CPUs, we start going to other directions to try to increase the performance of the computer. That's when we start to scale the CPU horizontally, and we are creating more CPUs instead of the faster CPUs. I still remember around 2007, I joined Intel. At that time, this, the, my, my college professor are still talking about like a dual core and a single core and the dual core processors. And Intel has about 16 cores processor in the, in the lab, right? So that's what we are playing with. And that's what's really the fascinating things at that, at that time. But when you have the like more processors instead of like just become faster, like have a faster processors, the problem is going to be how are you going to utilize these resources efficiently, right? So that gives the rise to the virtual machines, and also later the cloud computing. So by using virtual machine, you can have multiple OSs running on top of the same hypervisor on the same node. And each OS can still do their job and doing and running one applications if those applications not really doing well in the parallelized like environment. And they also give the advantage of being resource isolated from each other. So of course you know you can always do over provisioning and over commit, but at some degree, the hypervisor and the cloud computing, like virtualization, in like this technology, give you a way to better utilize your utilize your resources. So you're cramming more things together into single node, and hopefully you will raise the you are at least keep that node to be busy enough, like at least eighty percent or around eighty percent, right? Otherwise, you are really wasting your money and you're not really getting the full potential of your node, which you bought bigger CPUs, better CPUs with more cores. You want to use that all. So though in this situation, like how you organize those processes are changed. Of course, each VM has its own OS, has its own processes and the pain to and maybe floating around different CPUs, but they're not really going to be managed by packages anymore. They will going to, you are going to have like VM and the VM will going to have like images. So those workload 
will very likely be deployed through the image mechanism. And those images can get refreshed. And it's still not, not that good way to do it because it's not layered. Uh, it's very hard to layer them, but they should have, you should have golden images. And ideally, you will deploy that golden images and refresh it every once in a while. So you get all the CVE patched, you have the latest version of your service, you have the latest version of the application, and you deploy that to your all downstream clusters formed between the hypervisors on, your, on, on the different nodes, right? So that's become the dominant form of running your applications. Once we get to the virtualization world and the start also later, where you have the basically the unlimited resource pool you can tap into on the cloud computer. This is also remain the way how you're going to, how you are running your applications. But as I mentioned before, the VM images, because it contains everything, it contains the guest OS, it contains whatever data and all the dependencies, it's really huge. And it can be a few gigabytes or even 10 or hundreds of gigabytes images. It's very hard to manage. And this is not really like, and the, some people is also concerned about overhead we are adding to the virtualization level. But frankly speaking, the overhead part is become less and less with the more advanced technology, like the Intel's uh, VMX and the uh, AMD's SVM and also the EPT and other technologies make it much easier and much faster to be organized, to be optimized at the chip level. So that will be a less of concern. And also with the new technology as the, the VTD, the direct pass-through devices. But they are still feels kind of cumbersome if you like really focusing on delivery using those hundreds GB or tens of GB images and it's very useful, but it's not really that agile and flexible. Then we come with the container and the Kubernetes. So to me, like what really container is about, it's about delivery. The concept of the container, like LVX container, has been there for a very long time. And it's been there, I think, around time or even before the virtualization has taken shape. Like before the KVM making to the kernel, I remember that still like the secret group is there, the LVX is there, right? But it really makes difference is when the Docker comes in and packages things together and say, well, this is the image. And this image has all you need to run your applications and you just shoot and go, right? So that really makes a difference. That makes the deliver mechanism so much more lightweight, so easy to start. And on the other side, well, there are other benefits like container is very easy, like very quick to start. Don't need to wait for minutes to for the VM to start booting um, from the BIOS, like simulate the BIOS and go through all the checks, just like the normal OS, right? Though they are also like other downside, like I will talk about that later, right? But majority, like the really the most important thing about the container and the cloud native technology is, you build this image once, you run it everywhere like you can on the Kubernetes or previously the other competitors, Docker Swarm, and Mesosphere, and but now of course it's just Kubernetes. It's become an industry standard, and what I see at Kubernetes right now it's become application platform to support you to run your own applications, you run your own services, right? So what you only need to do is package your containers, um, package your services into the containers and then deliver that, deploy that into the Kubernetes. And you have all the benefit of like, like to have the highest view, like um, high CPU utilization, and you don't need to worry about HA and those things. Many of them are was addressed in very complex system or like proprietary system before in the virtualization world, but now Kubernetes takes that role, right? 
So it's enabled build once run everywhere scenario, which you can depend on. And the organization and the deployments are all using containers, which is new, but not so new. But that's it's really enable the agile, like this really much agile compared to um, what you have to do before, which is shipping a VM image every time. And now also, you know, the container images are layered and you can easily add on top of that just to change the delta and have OLIF F system, this caching mechanism is really efficient, what I mean is. And the starting container itself has very minimal performance overhead because you are essentially running in the same operation system. You're not really creating another separate domain for you to run things. You are on the same operation system. So the performance overhead is really small. So we're really happy now and it seems like the container will be the solution to everything, right? Or not? It turns out if you want to run your container, like as like your service inside the container in Kubernetes, you do require a lot of planning, like a lot of planning, right? There are a few things Kubernetes is not really good for. The one thing is the multi-tenancy. You know Kubernetes has RBAC rules and they control the resources, but you know that you might also know that this namespace isolation and RBAC rules apply to the object, but not apply to some services you might exposing like to the outside. So like Kubernetes itself is not like there's many progress being made on the multi-tenancy part, but each Kubernetes cluster, if you say, can I trust this to a complete stranger to do whatever they want, as long as I assign them to correct our back rules? Probably not. That's the one issues like Kubernetes have right now. A few other things um, also related to how are you going to uh, plan your resource usage very well, because you know, if you say this user for this namespace, I give them uh, such kind of resource and there will be a quota side to name namespace. And then whatever application, like whatever containers, pods in Kubernetes world, starting in that namespace, will to have like, what is your requested CPU and memory, right? So that's really cumbersome to program. You have to, planning them, you really have to plan them correctly to get your application wrong well. It's not like if you are throwing a virtualization environment, I give a total sum there, and well, then there you go. And I might overcommit it, and then I can live, like, live migration to another node and keep it running. That's kind of flexible. Flexibility is in fact not exist in the Kubernetes. So, this bare metal setup for the Kubernetes is best for well-defined production workload that's managed by one team. Everybody need to be collaborative rather than say, have somebody like complete strange come in and you can trust them with your, like with that namespace or that role, probably not. But, and also there are the problems. If you're running on very powerful bare metal server, and this is one really one of the reasons you want to um, for the production environment, right? So you want to have very powerful bare metal server, and you don't want to pay for those virtualization overhead. Good, but just be careful because you have to really define your container, like how much resource they want. And otherwise, there were going to be a lot of unused power, which you are not going to tap into. And that's just basically a waste of money and the result like higher cost, right? There's also, a, if one containers become like really demanding and you are not setting the correct boundary for that service container, they will going to have really horrible noise neighborhood problem. 
and if you cannot accommodate them all, right? Because there's not much that kind of isolation. You do have to do the isolation, like set the guaranteed CPU and the limited CPU per pod. I haven't really seen that much. Like people are really like to do that pod by pod. People normally, of course, go to do that VM by VM, but pod by pod, it's a little bit too much, right? But that is what you have to do if you want to run it well on the bare metal. Of course, all of this planning and unused computer power might means higher cost for you to operate. And the other problem, as I mentioned before, is we are assuming the users on the same Kubernetes clusters should be trusted. Why? Because if only one untrusted user get in, it will contaminate. It's very easy for it to get root access of the node, which is going to contaminate one of the node. And my, if that is also running an API server or what, and the, the, the permission escalate can really happen quickly, and you might able to, they might just able to attack the whole cluster and get whatever we want there, right? Because the isolation on the Kubernetes side is not as strong as the virtualization layer. You know, it's very hard to escape the like hypervisor jail. And there's many times, I think it might happen to every one of you. Like I create a VM, I forgot to set password. I'm never able to get in, right? And the VM is never able to get out. So that doesn't happen. Like it's it's very easy to ignore that problem, and to open, like, and didn't realize it's not what really happens on the container world. If you somehow have a root privilege container, it has full access to whatever is running on the node, and maybe whatever connection to it as well. So that's some kind of security risk there. That's why we are really trying to emphasize whatever you are having the um, Kubernetes cluster, like you give that to your team and you need to make sure those are trusted. So it's not really a one size fits all. You would like to choose bare metal Kubernetes clusters when you are focusing on getting the maximum performance possible. That means you need planning your workload and you need to plan for your, like normally, that will only really happen if you have well-defined production environment. And you are not going to require very strong multi-tenancy and the resource isolation. And that's because of security risk. And that's because of noisy neighborhood problem. And in the end, it's, in that sense, it's, it's better to be only one team to manage one cluster. And of course, you only be able to access by the trusted user. It's not less a problem in the edge location with the central management or like with well known the local team, but it is a problem if you run into this model on relative large data center. That's why we will recommend, well, if you run in this on the data center and the very huge Kubernetes cluster, it's better to be one team for it and it's better to be production environment. On the other side, you might want to choose virtualized the Kubernetes cluster when you require a strong multi-tenancy and or resource isolation. So this environment can be shared by the multiple team if you choose to go this way, right? Because the multi-tenancy is guaranteed by the hypervisor and the VMs. And the resource the utilization can be guaranteed by overcommitting the VMs, of course. You need to be careful with that and make sure your CPU like utilization is not too high. And otherwise, you might want to do some um, migration of the workload to the more idle um, nodes. And if you have untrusted users need to access the environment, like if you want to provide Kubernetes as a service on top of bare metal servers, you are not going to want to do that on a like bare metal Kubernetes level. You will want to do that to as um, to create virtualized Kubernetes cluster on top of VMs and give that 
to the users. We have seen this use case like quite frequently, and uh, like there are many Kubernetes dedicated service provider in the world, and everybody is using virtualization to for the use to provide to the user. Right. And also, of course, virtualized Kubernetes comes with cost. That's when like that's why people don't like it, right? And you are going to need willing to exchange that performance overhead for maximum flexibility in terms of multi-tenancy and the resource isolation, right? So that means like this virtualized Kubernetes environment is also a good fit for the dev and the QA environment. I'm not saying it's not good for the production environment. That really depends on what you do and like what you need and what's the performance requirements or like limitation you have. But for the dev and QA environment, it's no brainer. You should have the virtualized Kubernetes cluster running there to give your team the best the best flexibility. And also, as you might know, whenever you want to install applications on the Kubernetes those days, you will need to install the new CRDs, customer resource definition. And that is in fact the class of the main level resources. And you have to be the main of the cluster to do it. So if you give the like QA and DAF their own clusters, they can do it easily. But if you want to do it the central, central managed way, you are going to need to ask permission for your admin to install every application, which can be annoying. So the question, do I have to make a decision? Do I have to make a decision to go with the biomedical Kubernetes or to go with the virtualization Kubernetes? Like, I have to, I don't even know, right? So I don't even know, like, I, I can foresee my workload might be looked like, but I have to choose if I'm going to choose a solution right now, what I'm going to do. I'm not really 100% sure if I want to do the planning for the the Kubernetes, or if I don't need or need the flexibility of virtualized Kubernetes. So the answer is with Harvester. Right, so you don't need to do this choice. Do like do this choice before you decide what we're going to run on your cluster. There are some vendors really dedicated in running Harvester on the virtualized environment. In, sorry, in running Kubernetes in the virtualized environment, there are other vendors really dedicated to get how you get Kubernetes running on the environmental environment. And the Harvester, in fact is sitting in between and we are optimized and we have the experience on the both sides. So the key is, this is the flexible choice. So what is Harvester? So Harvester is, in our opinion, the next generation infrastructure for the modern applications. Harvester will be installed on your bare metal nodes and you will have completely on-prem infrastructure management using Harvester, and you can run any workload on top of Harvester. That's including VMs and the containers, they both support equally. And also Windows VMs, for sure. And this is Power Harvester, it's powered by the Rancher and the Window Neutral CNCF standard and the CNCF projects like Longhorn and Cookvert. I'm going to go into more detail later. So, by definition, Harvester is a cloud native HCI software to run your workload on prem. When I say workload, of course, I mean both VM and the containers. And Harvester is designed to be installed directly on the Bellman servers. And you can think about the Harvester like more in the same sentence of Nutanix or EXSI. And this, those are the some uh, products out there in the market inspired harvester, right? So you can use FPMI or XXE or even USB disk to install harvester, but it's going to take over your like whole system, your whole node and the formal cluster for you. So underneath harvester is powered by Slate Micro for Rancher and cloud native technologies like Kubernetes, Longhorn, Kubevert. There's other few like Kube VIP and like Kubernetes distro there is RK2 and, and so on. So 
all the technology Harvester is using is open source, right? So it's all vendor neutral and it's no looking. And really makes Harvester shine is we also integrate with Rancher to provide a single pane of glass to manage your cloud native container workload and the VM workload. As I mentioned before, they're treated equally. They're treated equally well, right? So that is the one thing, like you can have a one harvester cluster itself and you don't really need a rancher to manage that. But the ones you have like multiple harvester clusters, the rancher will be the one to have a visibility in all of them, right? Also new in the 1.2 release, and we also support to running your cloud native workload on prem directly. And that is in fact new. And we have a lot of customers asking us well, for this feature and they want more flexibility. And this is how we, how we do it. And the 1.2 release will like the schedule for the 1.2 release uh, will be announced this later. Let's take like, a like look at use case for Harvester. The Harvester was created originally with the concept like we want to help you to be more flexible with your Kubernetes deployment. So we are supporting your like virtualized Kubernetes in the VM really well. So Kubernetes clusters and can like different clusters, as you can see this picture, cluster A and cluster B can share the same node for the maximum utilization. Like that's also means like um, the best value for your money, right? And those clusters, of course, are separated by the total different networks. And we have provided the Harvest the CSI driver and load balancer driver to give you cloud-like experience for your Kubernetes guest Kubernetes clusters. Harvest also monitoring the hardware with IPMI protocols and some system level messages to give you the information about what's going on in your node. Are you about to need to uh, change your disk? Do you have like broken, uh, like bad RAM or so? And that information is Harvest also have. And we are also supporting uh, uh, supported uh, advanced PCI device management like SRV. And of course, you can also do the PCI pass through either the NIC card directly or your GPU workload. And those are also supported on the Harvester. So. This is the original use case Harvester was designed for. And but with the 1.2 release, we are expanding the scope of Harvester to support biomental Kubernetes use case. And in the 1.2, and you can you can see not only the VM view of the Harvester, but also you can tap into the class explorer, which is provided by the, the rancher, like some components of rancher to see the container view of your underneath cluster. And you can deploy your workload on top of that. So that is supported as a new experiment, experimental feature in 1.2 release. And many users asking us to support the developmental cluster use case, it's not only because they want to run a developmental workload uh, but also like container development workload, but also because they have a certain applications are running in the Windows environment, and those are still deployed and managed as VMs, and they want to run those VMs next to the container like on the development environment. So that use case is also supported. User can mix VM workload with cloud native workload, right? Those. So basically, the Harvester is acting as a bridge here to help our customers to migrate from the VM-based workload to a more of cloud-native way. And you can take your time and how long you how you, you need. And you can um, basically set your own timeline. There's no rush because you the all the use cases you wanted is supported by Harvester. Of course. Like the really what makes Harvester shine with Rancher is Rancher have the ability to manage multiple Harvest clusters in addition to whatever other Kubernetes cluster you want. In the upcoming releases, 
branch here, we are able to see the both container view and the VM view on the Harvester cluster. And this is give you a single pane of glass to manage all your uh, all your workload, container or VM, in the same place. So let's talk about the Harvester roadmap. Uh, before I dive into the detail of the roadmap, I do need to uh, say that whatever I'm sharing here is not a commitment, and whatever features and timeline may change when it really happens, right? So that's why we include the safe harvest statement for the roadmap here. All right, let's, th let's talk about the real thing here. Obviously, the 102 release is the targeting for next month, July 2023, and we are going to expanding the support to the bare metal container workload, as I mentioned before. And also, we're working on to provide an out-of-box rancher experience feature. And this is not, this is not really a like one-click deployment site, but we might have some easy way to answer the user's request um, to run rancher on the same bare metal cluster. Uh, the reason is, there are some implications if you have your management plane running on the same infrastructure as your under, underneath management layer, underneath like a downstream cluster, right? There's some security implication there. So it's not really, we are not going to recommend it for uh, the production workload for at least the foreseeable future, but we are getting we're getting feedback when people want to play with run with it and they want to try it out, and that's we added them there. So we also added third-party storage support for non-root disk. Like one big like market for the harvester or target market of the harvester is in the data center, which is understandably already have the established storage vendor there. So the third-party storage like support is there for those users who already have the storage plans in place to hook that to the harvester, right? So you have investment on the storage plans and already have the storage there, and that can be used with the harvester to create your new more workload with the like harvester nodes. So we also added SRV via pass-through support, and now for telco, Customers, there's a possibility that you can use SRV function from unique uh, from the underlying SNIC to to get better throughput on the network side, right? And we have hardware detection and uh, hardware error detection and uh, some more hardware enhancement building in the 1.2 release. And we have enhanced our cloud provider support. That is the, our guest cloud provider driver in the 1.2 as well. And we have reduced, we have introduced a way to reduce resource, resource footprint, including uh, disable our previous existing monitoring and the logging components to really satisfy the demand on the edge, at the edge scenario. So lastly, and we make it easier to configuration how is the cluster, because now we have a way to ship something similar to a cloud image on how is the version and you can install that image, you can flush that image to your cluster, like to a node, and then configure it after installation. That is very useful for the, like, um, for the use case like Equinix Metal and other cloud providers, which is, well, of course you can do the IPX installation, but it can take a very long time. But if you are imaging your node, like, uh, cloud provider, like a cloud image, cloud init type of image, and that next makes the things much easier. Okay. So those supported are added, are ad adding at the upcoming Harvest 1.2 release. So for, for Harvest 1.3 release, we are targeting by the end of year. And the biggest target, biggest topic there is definitely the first vGPU support. The currently, we are planning to support NVIDIA Amphere or later vGPU, which is also enables using the SRV technology. And that's just like with hotness of the AI and the machine learning those days, this is really, really on the top list of like on the top on everybody list, right? 
So we are also looking to the management DHCP support because the harvest right now, the uh, the network model we're supporting is mostly based on VLAN. And their request that is um, we should manage the DHCP via to make the life easier for the operators in the data center or in X locations instead of their appliance hand off the HCP addresses and we might able to do that. Right. There's a very big topic around this about what kind of network enhancement we should add. And also we are going to add witness note support. And that is in the scenario that you have three uh, you have two powerful nodes and another witness witness node, which is relatively small, um, but a lower cost. And many users want to um, in the edge locations, they want to use this way to load the total cost of the system, but still maintain high availability of the system. And we are also going to add USB pass-through support that is required for some um, devices on board and to pass through the uh, USB devices to the VM directly for some analytic, analytic or like diagnostic. And also we are planning to add real many shared storage support and that is in fact already um, provided by the other name uh, Longhorn, but we are going to um, per demand to expose that feature to in the Harvester 1.3 release as well. All right, so that concludes my session and any questions?